Let's talk some politics with my panel. In studio, John Phillips, host of The Drive Home on Talk Radio 790 here in L.A. And from Washington, Richard Fowler, political commentator and host of The Richard Fowler Show. Okay, gentlemen, let's get right into it. John, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, the Democrat, has come out against the Iran nuclear deal. He said he believes we should go back and try to get a better deal. You agree? Yeah, and I'll tell you what's going on here, though. He's going to be the incoming minority leader for the Democrats. Maybe. Maybe. It, it looks like the votes are there. And it reminds me of the Nader Trader. Remember that when that was going on in the year 2000, yeah. where they'd swap votes if you were in a swing state? You'd vote for Al Gore if you were in a state that was going to be decided one way or the other. You'd vote for Ralph Nader. That way you wouldn't uh, affect the outcome too much. That's what's going on in the Congress now. Charles Schumer has a lot of constituents who are very upset with the deal, so he's going to be able to vote against it, but the Democrats will make sure that the votes are there for the deal so that the, they, don't, they don't override the president. Richard, what do you think of Schumer deserting his president? Well, listen, I think Chuck Schumer is just wrong on this one. I think uh, if you talk to most folks, in, most folks in America, and if you think if you talk to millennials, they'll tell you that this is a really good deal. A Wall recent Wall Street Journal poll found, Larry, that overwhelmingly 40 percent of millennials support this deal because we understand that the world is in flat and America no longer lives on a pedestal. What we've got to do is we've got to, we can't go around being the world's version of the mean girls. We've got to have conversation, create dialogue, and really try to, you know, make sure that Iran doesn't develop a nuclear weapon. This deal slows down the Iranians' ability to get a nuclear weapon, and that is a good thing, Larry. But millenniums aren't the whole story, are they, All right, let me tell you how bad this deal is, Larry. It was able to unify the Republicans in Congress. That's like Tom Arnold and Roseanne getting back together with Ted Cruz suddenly on the same page as Mitch McConnell and that crowd. The Democrats are not even united in favor of this deal. So I, I dispute the fact that the public and millennials are for it. But there's a big split in Iran over it, too. And there's a lot of people in Iran opposed to it. Absolutely. Of and, the old hierarchy. And, and particularly Israel. And many of the, um, the, the members of Congress, two different delegations just went to Israel on their annual trip. And Benjamin Netanyahu sat down with these delegations and lobbied against this particular bill. Steny Hoyer, another member of the Democratic leadership, also not sold on the deal. Richard, do you think it's going to pass? Yes, yeah, so I think this deal passes overwhelmingly, and it's going to pass with a cross, with you know Democrats and Republicans coming together. It's going to be an actual bipartisan deal. Now, the funny thing is about you know the comments made by by your other guest there, Larry, is this idea that this is the same type of comments that we heard when we were negotiating with the Soviets, right? We can't negotiate with them. We negotiate with them, it's going to be awful. The world's going to come to an end. What we found was negotiating with our enemy was actually actually brought an end to the Cold War and actually brought down the Soviet Union. This deal deal, right? In the worst-case scenario, it slows down Iran's ability to get a nuclear weapon by, it, at minimum, 10 years. In the best-case scenario, it brings Iran back into the formal economy by getting rid of, by throwing the sanctions out the window, right, and allowing them to be normalizing trading relations with them. And number two, beyond just that, it puts, brings them into the formal economy, not making them a rogue state, and then they'll be a rational actor. I think that the, there's a lot of people who have sort of mistaken this deal for the wrong thing, and Benjamin Netanyahu was one of them. Right? He's going to say, speak doomsday on top of doomsday on top of doomsday. But the truth is, this deal is the best that we can get. Both Europe agrees, um, John Kerry agrees, and 40 uh, percent of millennials, according to a Wall Street Journal poll, agree as well. What's your alternative to the deal, John? Well, certainly the you UN don't want war, do you? The UN deal had more teeth in it than this particular deal. I was talking to a friend of mine who worked for the State Department during the Bush years, and he said, if you're going to take a deal, take the UN deal, because this deal takes the, uh, the, the sanctions were put in place because Iran would not let us take a look at their facilities and see what they had. When you remove that from the package, you allow Iran to do whatever they want. And he was saying that, that Benjamin Netanyahu's chicken little on this. Well, Benjamin Netanyahu's going to be the guy that gets nuked if the deal doesn't work. Here, 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 this is a couple problems with that logic of that argument there, right? It's because under this deal, the IAEA has the ability to go into, go in and inspect where these new, where the fissile material is being made. Therefore, there is UN verification, and verification is everything in this deal. That's what makes this deal work. The fact that we can go into their, you know, these respective areas where they're developing these fissile materials and really work on checking, right? That's what makes this deal such a good deal, right? It's not the best deal in the world. Nobody's saying it's the greatest deal in the world, but I think it's the best deal that we can get given the, given the time and place that we are, Larry. And I think it's really sad that Americans aren't looking at this deal in holistically and listening to talking points from one party or another. Okay, let's go to some other things. 
John, as a conservative, are you worried about Donald Trump or what? I think Donald Trump is fantastic. The numbers in that Republican debate were off the charts. 24 million people watched that debate. 36 million people watched it when you count the replays and, and the online views. It wasn't a debate, though. It wasn't a wide discussion of issues. One guy had one thing, one guy, what, well, you're with women? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? As opposed to, let's discuss, did they have, did we get their, all of their opinions on the Iran deal? No, but I'll tell you we what, we, we were able to learn a lot about the candidates, and everyone's attacking Megyn Kelly for the comment about Donald calling Rosie O'Donnell a fat pig. Well, I think it ended up working to his advantage because he turned that into an argument on political correctness. And he made similar points to what Jerry Seinfeld's making now, what Chris Rock is making, what people in popular culture are talking about this. So you think Trump is good for the Republican debate? Absolutely. And you know what? I bet you if you look at the numbers afterwards, the NBC poll came out, they have him in first place by double digits. Still? I think that those numbers are even higher because you have to look at Trump in the same way that you look at like a Jesse Ventura or an Arnold Schwarzenegger. They bring new people to the table, and if you're looking at a likely voter model, people who have voted in two out of the last three elections, well, that's not Trump's crowd. And all of the polls, you, you know this, Larry, here in California, right before the recall election, they said that, that Governor Davis would not be recalled, and if when, when we decided who would replace him, it would be Cruz Bustamante. Those polls were wrong because they underestimated the support of Schwarzenegger supporters. Same thing happened with Jesse Ventura. Richard Fowler, is, is Trump, as some say, a gift to the Democrats? Well, uh, he is the gift that keeps on giving. And I'm a good friend of Megyn Kelly. And I got to tell you, I found his comments both during the debate and the comments after the debate to not only be disparaging, but to be downright misogynistic, right? And I think what he, what Trump demonstrates, Larry, is where the Republican Party sits on many of these issues. They will go out and they will call all those folks who've immigrated to this country for a better life. They'll call them rapists. They will, they will d attack women. They'll attack LGBTQ folks. And they'll do it at their own peril. Because if you look at what the polls tell us, if you look at what the American people are looking for, they're looking for real common sense solutions and attacking women and attacking immigrants and attacking African-American folks and LGBTQ folks is not how you get there. And for those Republicans that are voting for him, you should question yourself. Do you want a candidate that can't answer the hard questions? And he really can. Uh, and I think the fact that we're comparing him to Chris Rock and Seinfeld proves the point. Well, we're not comparing him to Chris Rock and Seinfeld. I mean, we're he saying he's did. making the same arguments about political correctness as them. There was a piece in New York Magazine today talking about the fallout that Fox has received since the debate happened. And they, New York Magazine said that Roger Ailes had to call and apologize to Donald Trump because the, the feedback that they were getting was overwhelmingly pro-Trump and anti megan Kelly. The public has spoken. The poll numbers are the poll numbers, and the public sided with Donald Trump on this. People may not like it. People may not like what he has to say. He I, certainly I doesn't bet, use the I Queen's English. I differ on that completely. I think if you talk to the American people, I think if you talk to American women, they will tell you how he treated megan Kelly. The fact that he had the nerve to call her a bimbo on Twitter speaks to the fact that he's not only a misogynist, but beyond the fact that he's a misogynist, he speaks to the fact there is indeed a war on women, and this is a great display of it by Donald Trump's actions. Which poll says that he lost? Which poll says that he he is going? I agree with in you support? that he's doing well in the polls, and I think that's great for Democrats, and it's great for it's great because it shows that there's a clear contrast between the Republican Party. They will uh, they will sort of make the, they will make the king of the hill this guy who who will say things about immigrants, will say horrible things about women, right, instead of finding a candidate that can talk about common sense issues and common sense values and how to get America back on track. Another issue that wasn't in the debate, but Hillary Clinton brought it up. What about rolling out the plan to kill college debt? Yeah, look, this is Hillary, again, trying to get the headlines back, because all of the headlines... Well, is that a bad idea? Forget headlines. Is that a bad idea to kill college debt? Yeah, because, look, if you assume debt, you should pay it off. I don't understand why we live in this culture of bailouts, where we bail out corporate America, we bail out people that bought homes that they couldn't afford. People should look at, at college educations the same way you look at any other major purchase. You don't buy a car you can't afford. You shouldn't go to a university that you can't afford. There are junior colleges, there are state universities that are far cheaper than the University of Southern California or private universities. She said no student or family should have to borrow to go to a public college or university. Everyone who has student debt should be able to finance it at low rates. No, of course you should have to pay for it. Because the biggest beneficiary of a college education is the person who gets it. That's right. the best investment well, you can make for yourself. the country benefits, too. But the individual benefits disproportionately. Richard? 
Uh, I think, you know, clearly misguided on this one once again, Larry. Here's the facts. The facts are is this, that banks and businesses can refinance their loans and college students cannot. Hillary Clinton's plan allows for college students to be able to refinance their loans, which is a should be every American should be allowed to refinance their debt. They're allowed to refinance cars, allowed to refinance homes. Why they can't refinance college debt, only the good Lord in heaven knows. But beyond that point, if we don't deal with college debt as a nation, we will see the next Great Recession once again, Larry. And if you look across the world, all of our global trading partners, right, you see the investments they make in higher education. In China, they're investing thousands of millions of dollars, billions of dollars in making sure their people are educated and are able to participate in the marketplace. Same thing in India, same thing in Europe. We are the only developed nation in the world that is not investing in America's greatest resource, its people. And that's downright sad. It's downright unfortunate. And the fact that Republicans have not come out with a plan to get rid of college debt or deal with it, 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 shows, the, it shows the contrast once again between the two parties. The government says they don't have enough money to fix the sidewalks, yet they want me to pay for somebody's art history degree. All right, let's well, just I think we're talking about two different forms of government here. The government that fixes your sidewalk is your local government, and the government that talks about student the debt state is sort says of a they're broke. federal thing. The the feds say they're broke. But why is but why but why are they broke? They're broke because they've given too you people much spend all the money <laughs> to millionaires and billionaires, right? And these big tax giveaways. Well, we saw Scott Walker do it in even in Wisconsin. To say that. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, a couple, couple of quick other things. Do you have a favorite among the candidates? Oh, right now I'd vote for Donald Trump. You do? I absolutely would vote for Donald Trump. Uh, is Hillary a shoe in Richard? I think for the we're, nomination. We're, we're expecting a healthy primary. I think Bernie, Bernie Sanders' rise in New Hampshire sort of speaks to that. We're still waiting to see what the vice president's going to do. And I think Hillary Clinton, what she's going to do over the next 11 months before the, DN, before the Democratic National Convention is work on getting every single American voter to understand her story, understand how she wants to make sure that she levels the playing field for all working families in this country. If Trump were not nominated, who would you favor? Oh, boy. Um, I certainly don't like Jeb Bush. You don't? No. You know, when, when I was watching the debate, it was funny. He had zero enthusiasm. He had zero passion. It reminded me of going to a big hotel where you're there for, like, a radio convention. And there's lots of different ballrooms, and you wander into the wrong room, and you're in, like, the Cohen bar mitzvah. <laughs> and it takes you ten minutes to realize that you're in the wrong room. He looks like a guy that wandered into the wrong room. That he doesn't, he shouldn't be running for president. He doesn't want to be running for president, but he's just kind of there. Who of the Republican candidates, Richard, do you fear the most from a Democratic standpoint? Well, one, I got to tell you, I agree with him about Jeb Bush. I thought Jeb Bush had a horrible performance in this debate last week. But out of the candidates that I thought did the best out of the debate and who Democrats should be worried about, the number one of those is, jo is John Kasich. If he can sort of rise above the fray and get out of the sort of white noise of the Republican primary, he's the most inept to govern. Right. He has the, the, the best ability to govern. I think that sort of speaks volumes to him. Right. He was one of the few governors who took the Medicaid money because he understood the people in Ohio needed health care. And so he made a decision that wasn't about politics. It was about the best governance. Um, and, and so I think that makes him a very viable candidate. Also, we have to see what Carly Fiorina does in the next debate. We're going to have you both back frequently. Thanks. You were great, John. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Larry. Thanks to John Phillips and Richard Fowler. As always, Fowler, and as always, thank you for joining me on this.